Thank you so much. My name is Richard Gage, AIA. I've been a practicing architect for 20 years, and I'm a member of the American Institute of Architects. Tonight, we're presenting to you the technical truths, the evidence found for the explosive demolition of all three World Trade Center high-rise collapses on 9-11, the iconic Twin Towers and the mysterious Building 7. This is a controlled demolition. Let's focus on this type of destruction first. We have hundreds of examples from all across the country from which to make our comparison because it's the most commonly used method to demolish high-rises. This is what a high-rise looks like when it's being demolished with explosives. Let's take a look at some of the key characteristics of controlled demolition. First, we have a sudden onset of destruction at the base of the structure. We have straight down symmetrical collapse into its own footprint. Because demolition waves remove the column support, resulting in a free fall speed, virtually, through the path of what was the greatest resistance, thousands of tons of structural steel. We have a total dismemberment of the steel structure, so it's ready for shipment. We have minimal damage to adjacent structures, sounds and flashes of explosions heard and seen by witnesses, enormous clouds of pulverized concrete, squibs sometimes, explosive charges that go off at the wrong times, chemical evidence of cutter charges. These are all fairly typical, and they go to show us direct evidence of explosive destruction. Now, the interesting thing is that not one of these typical characteristics of controlled demolition can be explained or accounted for by fire, let alone all 10 of them. Typically, we'll have government documentation, expert corroboration, foreknowledge, and video documentation, all of which supports the hypothesis of controlled demolition, providing proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's take a look at World Trade Center 7 now. It was 47 stories tall, what would have been the tallest building in 33 of our states. It was not hit by an airplane. It was the third World Trade Center high-rise to collapse on 9-11 at about 5.20 in the afternoon. Here we have the 12th and 13th floor fires and the 7th floor fire on the north side of the building, the opposite side of the building that was being pelted by the North Tower. Now let's take a look at the evidence of World Trade Center 7 and see how it stacks up against the typical features of a controlled demolition, starting with, is there a sudden onset of destruction? Let's listen to this emergency word. We were watching the building actually because it was on fire, the, uh, the bottom floors of the, the building were on fire, and uh, you know, we heard this, this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder. Turned around, we were shocked to see that the building was, uh, uh, well, it looked like there was um, a shock wave uh, ripping through the building and the windows all uh, busted out and, you know, it was, it was horrifying. And then, uh, you know, about a second later, the bottom floor caves out and uh, the building followed after that and um, we saw the building crash down all the way to the ground. A sound of a clap of thunder, a shock wave ripping through the building and windows busting out and then the building coming down. Do we have a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint? Let's listen to Dan Rather narrate this collapse for us as we take our first look at the collapse of Building 7. What you're seeing are high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. Let's take a look in this side-by-side -side comparison with a known controlled demolition on the right. Did the building fall into its own footprint? Pretty much so. Do we have demolition waves 
And how do these remove the column support? Well, here's a floor plan of Building 7. Now, to bring a building smoothly, symmetrically, into its own footprint without falling over, what we have to do is remove the core columns because what we want to do is bring the outside of the building in on itself. Now, this involves a high degree of precision that fire is not capable of. Do we have a free fall speed of collapse through the path of greatest resistance? You can see second by second the building gaining downward momentum. You can plot the drop distance on a graph of time and it fits the free fall curve almost perfectly. What does this mean? That the columns had to have been removed and removed virtually simultaneously on each floor, synchronistically timed, so the building had no resistance virtually on the way down. Do we have a total dismemberment of the steel structure? We had a 47-story skyscraper compressed to four stories. Do we have sounds of explosions, though? How about Kevin McPadden? This was a boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was ex an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. Do we have enormous clouds of pyroclastic smoke from the pulverized concrete? Watch the concrete entrained in the air racing down every street in each direction at 35 miles an hour. Do we have pools of molten iron? Let's start with the South Tower now. This section applies to the World Trade Center Twin Towers and Building 7. We're told by NIST that this substance must be melted aluminum from the airplane. But melted aluminum looks like melted aluminum. <laughs> it's silvery. It doesn't uh, glow in daylight conditions. What do the first responders and the demolition contractors say about molten metal? Saw pools of literally molten steel. Molten metal beams had just been totally melted. It was dripping from the molten steel. Steel flowed in molten streams. They're finding molten steel. And this structural engineer, Abu Hazan Astani from Berkeley, cites and documents, I saw melting of girders in the World Trade Center. One of the more unusual artifacts to emerge from the rubble is this rock-like object that has come to be known as the meteorite. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat. And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. What's the problem with that? Office fires, Eager says uh, 1,200 degrees. A uh, NIST claims 1,800 degrees, for which we have no evidence for office fires of that temperature in the Trade Center towers. Structural steel doesn't even begin to melt until 2,700 or so degrees. We're missing 1,000 to 2,000 degrees of temperature, heat energy required to produce this stuff. Where is it coming from? We'll be taking a look at a possible suspect, thermite, which reaches temperatures of 4,500 degrees. Let's listen to John Gross, lead engineer of NIST, tell us about the molten metal from his perspective. First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel Molten steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like lava. Like, like, like lava. From a volcano. No eyewitness who said so. There actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. No eyewitness who said so. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped on the sides of a wall. No eyewitness who said so. The piece of metal that's draped over was molten metal. No eyewitness who said so. Saw pools of literally molten steel. Nobody who's produced it. This fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel. Nobody who's produced it. Nobody who's produced it.
Nobody who's produced it. NASA pictures, thermal images showed those sorts of temperatures in the basement. What is the problem here? Somebody's lying. I'm going to leave it up to you to make your own conclusions. How about chemical evidence, though? What produced all this molten metal? And what is thermite anyway? Thermite. An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which, when ignited, sustains an extreme heat reaction creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. Dr. Stephen Jones performed chemical analysis on the previously molten metal. He sent a sample from this 40-pound chunk of previously molten metal from one of those meteorites. He finds that it's predominantly iron, so we can rule out aluminum from the jet plane. It has small amounts of aluminum, sulfur, and potassium, and manganese and fluorine in abundance. Manganese is from the potassium permanganate, commonly used as an oxidizer in thermite. Fluorine is also used in sol gel type thermite charges. So these appear to be the thermite fingerprint. Gel explosives are a super thermite, tiny aluminum particles in iron oxide in this sol gel. They can be cast into shape. They're like a clay. Lawrence Livermore Lab did research on this. If sol gels were used, they would leave behind a very unique signature, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Uh, and in fact, EPA finds one molecule in their toxicological studies at levels that dwarfed all others, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Eric Schwartz says we've never observed it in any other sampling we've ever done.